I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Um, I am on Ghana country and I would like to pay the respects to the elders past and present for all of the countries that we are all coming in from today. In terms of introductions, I'm Kate Forrest, I'm facilitating today. I'm the uh, project lead for the Industry Partnerships Program for NRM Regions Australia. Um, Trish Cave, who you can see there, general helper uh, is the is the tech whiz and will make sure that everything keeps rolling along and keep me in check a little bit and of course the uh, the presenter today is Chris Cosgrove so today's session is understanding industry sustainability frameworks and it's an informational webinar featuring a presentation and then a Q&A mainly to talk about what the actual frameworks are what why they were developed, what drives their development and how industry uses them. The reason we're doing this is because uh, more and more uh, industry is formally, I guess, um, looking at how it can show that it's sustainable uh, so that it can um, enter markets. And they are also looking to partner more and more with natural resource management organisations around the country. So it's just important that we have a really good understanding of how they work. Um, today's presenter, Chris, um, he has an, an extensive experience with many of the sustainability frameworks around the um, country and is currently facilitating a project between the Cotton Sustainability Framework and um, a number of regional NRM organisations that have um, cotton grown in them. Um, and uh, looking at how we can have more regionally appropriate targets um, that also satisfy industry and are uh, to um, enormous for, for farmers to have to, to, to deal with. So Chris today will give us the underlying principles of the frameworks and what we need to consider when we're talking about them and what we might partner with them about. Um, this is the first of a planned series of monthly-ish um, webinars that NRM Regions Australia will be running. Uh, the next one is another one on markets and market access and you can help me out at the end by filling in the survey and letting me know what other topics you might be interested in. Um, these workshops have come from work that we've been doing with sustainability frameworks. So um, at the moment, mainly the beef, sheep and cotton sustainability frameworks, but we're also talking to grains, wine and dairy. So there is some uh, practical background to it. If you can make sure that you're um, microphones off while Chris presents. That'll stop us having any interference. And I'm going to hand over to Chris to speak. Thanks, Kate. And uh, hello, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Just a bit of quick background to me so you understand who this random person is talking to you about sustainability frameworks. Um, I grew up in, um, on a farm in the Darling Downs in Queensland. And you might be able to see I've got the skin cancers in my face as a souvenir, so you know how good is it being redhead kid in country Queensland? Um, I um, entered, um, I started my working career in public relations and investor relations, and had one of those life changing moments about twenty years ago where I decided I needed to get out of my bed and uh, and do something that's important because you only have one life. So I entered um, sustainability then as a public relations manager for an ASX listed renewable energy company in Melbourne. And I've stayed in sustainability ever since, apart from a couple of stints as a, as a home dad. Uh, in 2015, I put together my two favorite things, sustainability and agriculture, to form my own consultancy, specializing in agri-food sustainability consultancy. Um, I studied Mandarin and was living in Hong Kong at the time, so hence the Asia part, but um, I soon returned home back to Australia and am currently based in Hobart. Um, in terms of sustainability frameworks, I um, was consulted on along with many other stakeholders, the development of the beef sustainability framework and have attended most of those um, six monthly consultative committee meetings I have in the beef sustainability framework since then. Um, I've been working for over three years with the cotton sustainability framework to uh, develop and then implement the strategy, working with industry to, to do that. And I'm currently also working with the grains industry to define targets and indicators for their sustainability framework. Uh, that's a work in progress and we hope uh, that that will be launched um, in, the, in the near future. 
so I know a bit about sustainability and I have a, you know, a, a nice working knowledge of, of, of several frameworks. So I hope I can give you enough of an overview of what these things called sustainability frameworks are at the industry level and how uh, you know, there's the opportunity for all of you uh, and for industry to work together to, um, to get better outcomes. I'm just gonna talk through very quickly, and I promise this is the only page of, of theory, if you like, about what is sustainability, because sustainability is a bit like, you know, biodiversity or soil health. If you ask 100 people, you get 100 different answers. So I'm gonna give you my definition of what sustainability is, so we're on the same page, but also really importantly, the concepts I'll talk about here are applied by all the sustainability frameworks. So you'll be able to see how they work and how you fit into that as well, to that thought process, that, that strategic thinking. And also it's really important if you don't already know that sustainability is not just a wish list or a grab bag of nice things to do. It's a really strategic and a structured and a formal process to add value. Not just financial value, but building up the social and the natural capital of an organization as well, whilst performing well. So it's really about adding value. How does it do that? Um, this comes from what I think is the best sustainability management framework in the world is called the accountability AA1000 standard. And it has four principles. Um, the first is inclusivity. It used to be so important. They used to call it the foundation principle, but now it's just one of the four principles. And it's all about engaging with your stakeholders. Um, for me, coming from a, a stakeholder engagement, that public relations, investor relations background, um, uh, that this, this, is, this is how you can see that I've been into sustainability, not as an environmental scientist or anything, but there is legitimacy there. And inclusivity is about knowing and including stakeholders in your decision-making and being accountable to them. So it really starts at the top of an organization, that, that, that commitment to accountability, but then who are your stakeholders? What's most important to them? And whenever I talk to clients, you know, first it's about just thinking, you know, who are your stakeholders? Sit in the boardroom, work it out. And what do you reckon is most important to them? And normally be about 90% accurate in terms of, you know, what's most important to them. Then start to ask them, how are we going? What's most important to you? What are we missing? Then as you get more advanced or more comfortable in your relationships, sit around the table and say, this is a problem we've got. How should we solve it together? So it's a, it's a spectrum of, 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 of including stakeholders and looking to, to, to solve shared problems. With all the best will in the world though, you can't solve everything that's important to everyone. So the next principle is materiality. So that's working out what's most important to you as an organization or, as in, or an industry and to your stakeholders. And typically you'll see this in sustainability reports all the time. It's on a matrix of most important things to stakeholders on this axis, most important things to, a, uh, uh, to, to your company or industry on this axis. And the stuff that's in the top right, most important to you and your organization, uh, sorry, to your organization and to stakeholders are what's most material. So they're the things you should be focusing your resources on managing. Responsiveness is just then management 101. Once you've prioritized what's most important, manage it with, your, with the appropriate resources and systems and policies and, uh, and those sorts of things. And then finally, measure your impact. And then you go back to the start um, and you say to the people who are, who are important to you, this is how we're doing, this is our impact. We're finding materiality and ongoing. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. So that's the what and the how of sustainability that comes, as I say, from the, uh, the AA1000. I haven't just given you a definition um, or given you the why. Um, most definitions of sustainability are around uh, a definition that was established back in the mid, mid 80s around meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs, which is a very profound and a lovely thought, but I found very on, very alone when I was talking to, to corporates and particularly listed companies that it's utterly meaningless because these guys, especially in, in, in you know, big CEOs, they're worrying about what happens this quarter, this year at the very most. What happens in future generations is a nice to have, but really you've got to get more cut through uh, than that. And the same goes with farmers as well. Whilst they all know they want to hand off their farm in a better condition and, and, they're, and they're much more mindful than the average CEO of, of the next generation, they still need to manage the here and the now. So my definition or my explanation more accurately that best describes the value for sustainability, the business case for sustainability, and reflects that, that process you can see above is that if you know and manage what's more important to the people who impact your success, you're more likely to be successful. So it's a deceptively simple, I think, concept, but it, it's, it's very, very logical. Know who's important to you, refine and prioritize what's most important to, to everyone and manage it. 
sustainability though is very messy. Um, when I first started back in 2002, there was really only one organization which tried to standardize reporting and indicators and these sorts of things. In the last decade, for reasons I won't go into, there's been an explosion of ways to report or to measure or to make strategy and those sorts of things. It's a really uh, inexcusable jungle of, of ego and conflicts and just it's just it's just ridiculous. But it is what it is. And for people working in sustainability, for sustainability frameworks or, or, or corporate sustainability practitioners, they need to try and navigate their way through this jungle and adopt some, not adopt others, and, and, and work to, to improve what they've identified as most important. Certainly for all the industry sustainability frameworks and for most sustainability people, the one constant in this sort of jungle here is this sustainable development goals, the UN sustainable development goals. That's really our our Southern Cross around North Star. So the sustainable development goals are 17 of them. Most of them have about 12 to 15 indicators or targets. Um, and in the industry sustainability uh, world, what we'll do is we'll identify um, what's most material and we will align that to a relevant sustainable development goal. So we can have more confidence that we've identified not just something is important, but this is the level of ambition we should be working towards. And that's something that, um, you know, it's just something that all, all stakeholders expect. So the SDGs are, are very, very important. So onto the sustainability frameworks themselves. So this is an, uh, an, ex, an exhaustive list. I've, I've, I've left some off, um, rice, for example, um, purely just from space. You can see it's pretty crowded as it is. And then I listed them alphabetically. So I know there's, uh, I think Melanie Leather I saw from uh, the Beef Sustainability Framework. I'm not saying your most important, Melanie, but um, beef of beef comes first, okay? So that's, uh, that's, that's the logic there. I've mapped out just the, in terms of um, what each of these industry sustainability frameworks have identified as material. So they've all gone through that process. I spoke about before of engaging with their stakeholders, defining what's material, which is this here, and now working to respond appropriately and to measure impact. Um, it's not you know, complete. So for example, the beef sustainability framework they also look at soil and water, and um, but these areas here are the most what they define as the, you know six five of their six priority areas. For example, you can see there because every industry is different, every industry has different stakeholders. What's most material to them is different as well. But there are some constants. So, so for everyone, which is encouraging for yourselves, you know, land management or biodiversity is very important. As is climate change. As is keeping people safe. Because that process I outlined before about you know, inclusivity, materiality, et cetera, et cetera, is an ongoing process, these frameworks are not static. They're constantly being refined and evolved based on what's important to stakeholders, based on uh, legislative changes, based on technology, based on changes to the environment. So for cotton, for example, we're seeing um, more and more pressure come on to, um, to, uh, to, to, from customers about human rights. So we're taking a closer look at how we can put human rights into this. Probably waste is something we need to look at as well, but that's um, to, to, be, to be decided. But as always, it's about it's lovely to manage everything, but with your resources available, what are the highest priorities in terms of opportunity and risk to manage? I haven't filled in the, just as an FYI, the economic um, uh, column there, because it's not really relevant so much to, um, to, to yourselves, to NRMs, but that's things like profitability for farmers for, um, uh, industries that are close to the consumer, things like food safety, et cetera, et cetera. So a couple of the things just to give you a quick snapshot of how these work. All of these sustainability frameworks operate at the industry level. So they're not trying to say what's happening on every single farm, they're aggregating up data at an industry level so that more informed decisions can be making. And I'll talk about that on the next slide or two. Um, they're not a standard, they're not a, um, a, a brand or a marketing claim. They're not compulsory. They're just simply trying to aggregate and that, that data and aggregate performance of what they've identified as most important to them to tell those stories um, internally and externally. The boundary for all of these frameworks is at least the farm, the geographic farms that's on which, on which uh, the produce is grown. Some of them go beyond that, go further up the supply chain as well. But um, that's, that's defined by each um, uh, uh, framework. The time boundary, if you like, most of these frameworks will try to report annually. But as you know, 
getting data and accurate data is a real challenge. And so they don't always, the data isn't always updated annually, but they, but that's, that's what's the, um, is normally try, um, aims to happen. The governance, the ownership of these is typically with the peak body, which is the, the organization that represents growers or, and or the, um, the R and D corporation of that industry. So for cotton, for example, where I spend a lot of time working, uh, the sustainability framework is a joint initiative of cotton Australia, the peak body and cotton, R&D Corporation, the research body. For the Beef Sustainability Framework, for example, um, it's an initiative of the Red Meat Advisory Council, which is, uh, I guess, the overarching body, if you like, of, uh, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think there's nine uh, uh, peak bodies and R&D corporations representing production and feedlotting and um, processing and, and live export. So there's a definite governance structure there that reports to boards to manage what's most material and to, um, and to improve over time. Some of these frameworks will have targets, some won't. Some are in the process of setting targets, some aren't, but all of them will have indicators of what of how to measure performance in these areas. Um, just like the previous slide, you, show, you, you, you saw that um, sustainability is messy, so are indicators, unfortunately. There isn't a whole lot of consistency, or at least it's not as much as consistency as it should be across indicators. Um, work is underway to try and make, make that better, but um, that's you know, very important moving forward. So that's a quick snapshot of how those sustainability frameworks work and, and what their scope is. So why all the effort, why is this happening? Um, to me, there's three drivers of value, which are the same for a company doing sustainability as it is for an industry doing sustainability. And then these ones here, risk, productivity, and market access. On the risk um, side of things, little known fact, um, farmers hate being regulated. So to avoid regulatory risk, a really good way to do that is to make sure regulators know, you know what's important to voters and that you have evidence to show that you're managing it appropriately. Physical risk is, you know, climate change, for example, is, is, is the obvious physical risk impacting on agricultural sectors. Um, and that physical risk often has financial risk um, uh, in terms of, you know, the impacts of, of, of those things. There's other drivers, subtle, subtleties to financial risk as well. So increasingly, some sectors, you think about um, fossil fuels, for example, um, are having difficulty to access finance. But even in agriculture, we're just starting to see um, sustainability linked products from banks and insurance companies, where there's a the potential for uh, lenders to have a slightly lower rate, or perhaps more accurately way of saying it would be non people who don't who don't don't meet sustainability criteria may have to pay a little bit more maybe that's that's something that's sort of coming in slowly and people are working it out but the cost of capital is a is a real benefit and reputation again to go back to that process if you know what's more important to most important to your stakeholders to people who impact on you then you're more likely to avoid the risk of negative um expect negative um perceptions i haven't put a a, a title on this i'm sorry but this comes from a an annual trust research, which the R and D's, the, all the all the agricultural sectors uh, contribute to, it looks into community trust, and it finds that the two biggest drivers of trust in the amongst the community for agricultural industries, and trust in turn leads to acceptance of agricultural industries, is environmental responsibility and industry responsiveness to community concerns. So, if a whole industry wants to demonstrate environmental responsibility, wants to demonstrate they, that they understand and respond to what's important to consume to the community, then the sustainability framework at industry level is the obvious no-brainer way to do that. Productivity is um uh, is 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 a second source of you know of value and, and a reason why all organizations are doing this. Efficiency is is the obvious one. You do more with you do more with less through doing sustainability well. You use less energy, um, use less water, apply less inputs to create the same uh, amount of output. That then leads on to financial um, benefits. So if you're using less inputs, your costs are typically lower. You also have, for example, less cost of, of injuries. If your injuries are lower, less staff turnover. So there's lots of drivers of, of lower costs. Often people will say you get higher revenues from sustainability and doing it well, but I'll put a maybe there because really that depends on the skill of you as a business owner or as an industry. To, um, to, uh, to, to, to drive, drive the revenues. And also it's often out of, your, out of your hands. And an often forgotten about 
benefit of, 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 of sustainability and, and a productivity benefit is the innovation dividend. So if there is a, a strong desire to, um, to work towards an ambitious goal, so beef, for example, has a carbon neutral 2030 goal. In cotton, we're doing some really interesting work in, in a number of areas. All the other sustainability frameworks also are doing very, very, you know, pushing the boundaries in certain areas. That stimulates problem solving, it stimulates people coming together, which then catalyzes into lots of other benefits in terms of innovation. So a real, and there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's research around showing how beneficial that is and tangible it is. The third driver of value is market access um, and, uh, and, and, and growth. So people often ask, is there a premium for sustainability? Um, the answer is no, um, unless you can, unless you can, um, you're very good at marketing. So premiums are a function of brand and brands take constant resources to, um, to, um, to have that premium stay, stay in place. But increasingly, uh, customers, but also whole countries are asking for evidence of sustainability performance to allow you to get, get that market in the first place or to stay in that market. At the country level, the EU in particular is leading the way there with um, lots of legislation. So if you're a canola grower here in Australia, you must be certified to a sustainability standard to export canola to the EU. Um, labeling requirements coming into France, where you have to put a label of the environmental impact on, on produce. Carbon border adjustment mechanism is something where it's basically a tax, where if you, uh, it applies only to seven commodities so far, like steel and uh, aluminium fertilizer, energy intensive industries, where uh, if your carbon footprint is, 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 sorry, is, is higher than what it is in Europe, then you pay a tax to make up the difference. So lots of that's coming in. But even if the, if the countries, if you say, well, that doesn't matter, I don't really want to export to, to Europe, almost all the major multinational companies who, who make and sell food and fiber are adopting one or more of these frameworks, which I, which I highlighted on a previous slide. Um, and they all have targets and they all have guidance related to natural capital, be that um, native vegetation or biodiversity, water, soil, uh, and often lots of social capital sort of uh, metrics as well. So increasingly there's pressure coming down the supply chain from whole countries or from customers about the need to demonstrate environmental sustainability. So three real drivers of value there and need to be doing this, reducing risk, increasing productivity and staying in the game. The purpose of these is really to make more informed decisions. Um, at the industry level, um, being able to aggregate up and see how you're performing across the areas that you know are most important to your stakeholders helps to define resource allocation. Should we be spending more or less time and money on certain areas or others? And helps you tell a story to your stakeholders. Those stakeholders typically are the farmers and people outside your industry. The farmers being able to tell that story about sustainability performance um, allows them, or should be allowing them, um, to work towards productivity and profitability. So it's not mutually exclusive, by adopting sustainable practices, um, you can create value on the farm that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that helps manage that, uh, get, realize that that productivity gain that helps reduce risk for you and for the whole industry, and it helps you um, access markets whilst also improving productivity. For external stakeholders, it's really about trust, allowing them to make more informed decisions. Um, you've gone through the process of defining what's most important to them, so now, they can decide, are they more likely to want to work for you or buy from you or not regulate you or whatever it might be. If you have evidence um, and you can show that you're working with programs to respond to what's important to them, they're much more likely to build trust. So that's an overview of frameworks and how they are. What's in it for you then? How does it work for you? Well, for me, I guess I'll be just taking it back to this, this process, which all the sustainability frameworks follow to varying extents and, and work through. You know, if you look at inclusivity, that's about being involved. You already are, so you know, stay involved. Materiality is about solving problems. And for me, that's for the working with NRMs, it's about finding shared problems. It's really, really important. None of us have enough time or, time or resources to spend time doing something just for the fun of it. It has to be a real genuine problem that we've identified to be solved. When you're looking to engage with sustainability frameworks, I'd suggest keep in mind that these are industry-wide bodies. Uh, they work at the national scale. So an individual NRM region is unlikely to be, to, to be able to, to initiate a partnership 
unless it's a partic on a particularly important topic that can be scaled up uh, nationally. Ideally, we want to be able to work at the national scale and have that consistency and impact right across the nation. That's, that's the ambition of these sustainability frameworks. Once you've found a shared problem, we found a shared problem, then to me, responding appropriately means in a partnership, just being boots and all in on collaboration and all that comes with that. Um, you'll have various views on, on this, but to me, you know, respect, you know, respecting the skills and resources that NRM regions have and that industries have and looking to leverage the strengths of, of each organization. I hate duplication, <laughs> you know, death to duplication, you know, so, um, you know, the, the, the more we can coordinate and collaborate and the less we, we duplicate what's happening, then the better the outcome will be uh, for sure. And for me, also part of collaboration, especially when it's multi-party collaboration, is that you'll never get perfection, but you can get progress. Um, that's still robust and then a lot of thought has gone into it, but we can move forward. And start to get those early wins that we all know is necessary and then improve over time. Then when it comes to measuring impact, to me, it's all about consistency, you know? So having, I can't see what's behind there, but it's there because it's behind one of my screens, but um, um, you know, having consistent messaging and consistent way of measuring what happens on farms is just so important, not only across regions, but across industries as well. So we need to be working and we are working with, you know, in cotton, working with other broad acre sectors like beef and sheep and grains to, to make sure the indicators we use, the messaging we use is consistent. So farmers are hearing wherever they are, a single message, they're hearing a single way to measure it. It'd be lovely if we can get that consistency happening with NRMs and others. Um, Sorry, I was finishing this, this slide off on a, on, on a Friday. So I was obviously, um, Friday afternoon, obviously playing with the animation to keep myself uh, entertained. Um, wouldn't it be lovely? Wouldn't it be lovely if every farm, wherever they are, in this case, it's in Tasmania, obviously, because that's where I am, um, was getting consistent messages from sustainability frameworks, but also from everyone else who has input to them, to, from banks, from governments, from um, land care, from other input providers about what they should be doing in terms of native vegetation or water or, or, or health and safety and having the same messaging as well. And that messaging and those targets and those aspirations align to regional NRM priorities. So everything you do on a farm contributes to a regional identified priority, which in turn is aligned to and contributes to state priorities, which in turn contributes to national and then into global goals. That's the sort of, you know, I think, uh, big picture thinking, I think, that's, that's the wrong word. That, that's, that's the potential I think we have for, for these, for having uh, partnerships at a regional level and at an industry scale. I'll just leave you with just a couple of examples then of um, how this works in practice. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not gonna talk about this in detail because um, Stacey Vogel, the Cotton R&D Corporation uh, re re NRM manager will be speaking at the NRM conference in Margaret River next month. So you have to go along there, but just in summary, uh, in the cotton industry, we know that native vegetation and biodiversity is one of the, the key uh, areas. It's, it's material to the industry. There's a lot of challenge in measuring biodiversity, as you know, is this, it varies by region. Um, there's no agreed metrics anywhere, and it's really, really challenging, right? So we've been waiting. We, we don't have the resources to, to go and, and spend a lot of time and money on, on some particular indicator or measure, if that's then superseded by, by, by events, by how the, the industry and, and other industries or, or globally measured biodiversity and native veg. But at the same time, we can't wait too long because our customers are saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? So our approach is to work with the seven NRM regions in cotton's traditional um, uh, cotton growing areas to see if we can get consistent indicators on measuring biodiversity across those, um, those, those regions and then set regionally specific targets that are in line with NRM priorities for each of the regions. So it's really working at that regional scale um, to, um, to, 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 to drive change. And importantly, we're trying to do so in a way that's uh, reflecting those big sustainability frameworks that are out there, um, like the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures, Science-Based Targets for Nature, Post-2020 Biodiversity Framework. So this is a really ambitious and, and challenging um, project, but we're getting, uh, so far, um, having a very good relationship with the NRM uh, regions that are involved, and, and I think there's a lot of goodwill and and hope that we can keep pushing this forward. Um, so to me, it's been a very positive and a very good example of, 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 of collaboration and partnership. Um, the other case study I'll give you at an even easier level is that consistency of message. So soil health is, um, 
uh, one of the areas that is important to most um, sustainability frameworks, and I know is important to you as well. Soil health, just, you know, you, you, you all dealt with soil scientists. Many of you are soil scientists probably. It's, it's a very complex area, which means different things to different people. So for us in the cotton industry, we've developed this framework to try and make it simple to understand what you should be doing on a farm rather than worrying about measuring stuff until that measurement process is, is, um, is, um, is finalized with the national soil strategy and others. So we talk about focusing on the principle, you know, soil is alive. So what does life need? It needs food and shelter. So there's a couple of key principles you can do to protect soil health, whatever you have, whether it's a cropping enterprise or grazing enterprise or anything else. Um, there are a number of practices you can take in line with those two principles. These relate to cropping, but obviously, again, it can be changed easily to, uh, to other sectors. Um, those practices support soil properties. Those properties support soil functions. Um, so as an example, you know, it'd be very easy for any of you to, to use this, you know, rip off the cotton logos and stick your own logo on it and, and, and use this sort of messaging to, um, uh, if, if you like, to have that consistent message out to, to your audiences as well. I think that's all I have. Oh yes, I'm just going to follow up with a final slide. So just summer, sum, summing up, what are the partnership opportunities? For me, it's about finding that shared problem. You can see what industry frameworks are aiming to do. You can see that they're, net, that they're national in scale. So what are they doing that's in line with what you're doing uh, in, in your regions? Really commit to collaboration and then really work hard to be consistency in how we, we measure and how we communicate to farmers uh, what we're doing. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll hand back to you. I'll stop sharing and hand back to you, Kate. Thank you, Chris. That's, that was great. And uh, very, <laughs> a pretty good uh, approach to um, summing up something that's quite complex and quite large and is working across all sorts of um, industries and also levels of industry across the world. So thank you very much for your time and, and um, putting that presentation together. We really appreciate it. So I've got um, one question here from Rachel Clark. Please, everyone, if you've got questions for Chris, whack them in the chat or put your hand up and we'll, uh, we'll keep track of you. And Rachel was wondering <clears throat> if there's a sense from different industries um, on the extent to which their members are considering and adopting the measures that are being picked up in the frameworks. And by members, I'm going to assume she means farmers. Farmers, yeah. Um, so uh, these frameworks will report um, every year and every year you'll see the change or a couple of years when the, when the data is available. So, um, there is change happening. We can we can see over time that, that you know the various indicators of impact are, are improving, but how much it is uh, is is you know that that's as you know being uh, in NRM it, it depends on you know on a whole heap of factors in terms of getting people to adopt change and not and, and whatnot. But um, the purpose of these industry frameworks is to communicate at an industry level to, to individual farmers what they need to be doing to reduce industry risk to gain those productivity benefits from them and to keep um, access to markets. Um, so uh, the second part of Rachel's question was how individuals consider and implement these practices over time. And I might have a crack at that. So within the industry frameworks are really looking at um, how the industry responds to, to these challenges and to market requests and, and all those sorts of things around the world. And the way that that uh, gets down to the individual farmers tends to be through industry um, programs, research development and adoption programs as well. So it's not a direct thing that the, the farmers themselves, they might know that the industry has a sustainability framework, but they're not asked to report to it. The indicators that are used tend to be um, aggregated across, across the country. So that's, I think that's, um, like it's a something uh, that has taken me a while to get my head around is that the frameworks they they don't talk to farmers they talk to industry level markets and and looking at trends analysis and the industry bodies look at how that can be applied and that's where um the NRMs are coming in so making sure that we interact with the with the frameworks in a, in an appropriate manner. 
Um, are there any, yes, there are, there are more questions. That's great. Um, so Kristen de Exter from, um, is curious about emerging links with environmental markets and supply chain certification, which share some of the same drivers. Do you think emerging environmental markets could drive some standardization in terms of indicators, metrics, monitoring and accounting approaches? It's a small uh, question there for you, Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and I think there needs to be a, and, and there will be a communication. So if you look at the um, the National Biodiversity Program um, um, that was announced um, a couple of weeks ago, they're about to launch into a consultation process on, on exactly that. So I guess what we're hoping in the terms for us, at least anyway, in the work we're doing within our emergency is by being a bit proactive and showing this is what we think will work. And then if we can prove it works, then we can influence that, um, that, that process. But part of our engagement as well is talking to people like the New South Wales and Queensland, you know, the ERF and the Biodiversity Scheme in New South Wales to make sure that they're aware of it and also they have the chance to, 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 um, to, to, to change if need be. Um, unfortunately, there's, there is still a lot of inconsistency between those various market-based programs. So we certainly yeah, have to be aware of it um, and have to be as consistent as possible. Um, the challenge we have is that we're getting pressure right now from customers saying, what are you doing? And if we wait, longer for that consistency, um, that standardization, it'll, it's, it's going to be a, a quite a way away yet. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, are there any other questions that people have? You can either pop them in the chat or pop your hand up. Um, Chris, I think um, the work that NRM Regions Australia or the regional NRMs uh, through New South Wales and and Queensland uh, doing with cotton that Stacey is going to be talking about at the NRM Knowledge Conference. We've got a whole concurrent session on um, industry sustainability frameworks and um, NRM's involvement with those and also some of the programs that they're delivering. So um, Kylie Fletcher is going to be talking about uh, um, <clears throat> the, the work they're doing within the carbon neutral um, 2030 stuff for MLA as well. So there's some really good detailed work. But the thing I like about the work we're doing with cotton is that it is looking at regionalizing some of these important environmental indicators, which um, both industry and NRM and pretty much everyone else, including the environmental markets, are having uh, trouble finding consistency with. So we're looking at, okay, how can we do this so that it's consistent from the market and the international market sense right down through to um, the farmer's sense because they are only going to want to report um, once or twice and they might be involved with more than one agricultural industry. So I think that um, we're making, we're attempting to make some headway there. But yeah, it's, um, it's a really um, messy, messy space at the moment. Okay, doesn't look like we've got any more questions. So we're going to be, uh, oh, hang on. I spoke too soon. Anya's put one in. She's still, uh, she sees a big gap between developing these frameworks on one hand and if they're consumer driven, but most landholders need the financial reward in order to engage. How do we close that gap? So that's from Anya. So the answer to that is we need to make the case stronger on those three drivers of value, I think, Anya. Um, it's not just a direct financial reward you'll get. Um, there is also that, that is part that is part of it. Uh, as part of that is uh, the other ways of doing that are to demonstrate the productivity gains more 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 accurately. And part of that is valuing natural capital, for example, which is not easy, but that's something we're looking to do in cotton as well to make that easier. It's looking to spell out that this is a market access issue increasingly. If you don't do it, then that's fine. You mightn't get the get the financial reward directly, but you also want to have a you want to have a market or some markets to to, to sell to, um, and also it's just about risk. Um, you know, if whole industries are seen, like not even whole industries, because you know it only takes one or two individuals. We know that to um, uh, to impact whole industries. Um, so you know there is a real risk um, for industries if farmers um, don't have to follow this to the letter, but, but they need to be, be, be aware of the risks, that there is a real downside into not, not taking these things seriously. Um, and, you know, that, that's a really challenging conversation to have. It's not easy because yes, you're right. No one wants to change unless there's money on the table, but, but we need to make the case more, more strongly. And we're trying to do that in the cotton framework that there are many sources of value, not just that direct financial reward. 
Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Anya, for the question. It is, um, yeah, it's a really important question. And that, um, that question of market and market access is really, um, is really strong. It, so there's, there's financial reward and then there's not having a market to sell your product into. And um, that could be the result of Australian industries not meeting the sustainability expectations of world markets. So I am. Um, uh, so the next uh, webinar that we've got coming up, which is on October seventeenth, and because you've been involved with this one, you've registered for this one. I'll send you a direct invite to that. We have Ian McConnell, who is the chair of the um, Global Beef Sustainability Roundtable, and also Sustainability General Manager for Sustainability at Tyson Foods, coming to talk about market and market access. So. Um, it's, it's good to try and get your head around that because that it, it can change the way that we, we think and speak about sustainability and, and the consequences of, of not meeting the, the targets around the world. So I think we'll, we'll call it uh, quits there. I am about to do the obligatory uh, sending of the feedback survey. Please, please, um, fill this in this time around. This is the first one of these webinars we've done. If you liked it, please tell us. If you would like something to change, even more, please tell us because uh, we, will, we can make adjustments to the, both the presentation style and the content. So please fill it in, I would really appreciate it. I'm going to say a big thank you to Chris uh, for his presentation. It takes um, a lot to get your head around this stuff and be able to present it in 20 minutes. So uh, he saved me attempting to bumble my way through it. So thank you very much, Chris. And thanks to Trish and Rachel Clark, who have been in the background helping me out. Um, I will... Um, just do a quick promotion of the NRM Knowledge Conference. It's If you're coming along, uh, I'm running a workshop on partnerships on the Monday with Gillian Heyman, and that's all based on the work that we've been doing with um, sustainability frameworks and industry across the past um, five years, and Gillian has even longer experience than that. So, yeah, look it up and go... Um, if you can come across, please do. And if you are coming across, make sure you're there for Monday morning and you come to our workshop because it'll be great. Um, and we've also got a session on Wednesday around the industry sustainability framework. So that's a concurrent session with four presentations and then a QA. and a So it's an hour and a half. You'll have um, Warwick Rag from the National Farmers Federation, uh, Chris and Stacey from Cotton, uh, Edwina from the Beef Sustainability Framework and Kylie Fletcher and Joe. Uh, Johanna Tomlinson um, from South Coast NRM in Western Australia who are working with the Carbon Neutral 2030 program of the MLAs. So yeah, thank you very much for coming along. Please do fill in the feedback form. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everyone for participating.